Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're starting another big franchise, because I'm looking at Wrong Turn, released in 2003. Wrong Turn is a bloody slasher that spawned five increasingly bloody and booby sequels, with the latest released in 2014. There should be a reboot coming out soon, though, since they finished filming it last winter. The Wrong Turn films, which follow a group of messed up cannibals in the mountains of West Virginia, flourish in the age of Saw and Final Destination, and boy does it show. Most of these movies focus on the blood and guts spewing from casts of bland, mean-spirited characters. The settings swap places, the filming quality varies, and the only consistent character is a single cannibalistic killer, the high-pitched squealing three-finger. <laughs> I hope y'all are ready for one long summer barbecue, because this people eaten series is gonna take us to the end of July. Though I do have something lined up for the more squeamish among you too. Just give me a few weeks to get it ready. You're gonna love it. The first wrong turn, much like the first Saw and Final Destination, is not nearly as gory as its torture porny sequels. It's also much simpler than some of the later films. All we have here, story-wise, is a group of college kids getting stranded in rural West Virginia and subsequently hunted by cannibal mountain mutants. Though the kills aren't as graphic as what we'll see later in the franchise, this is still a mighty bloody movie, which is why today's episode is sponsored. Total AV offers real-time protection for your web browsing, keeping you safe from viruses and malware, even if you make a wrong turn on the internet. It can be used on your Mac, PC, smartphone, tablet, all of your devices, to encrypt your browsing data and keep you safe from hackers trying to cannibalize your credit card info. Since it runs in the background, you won't even notice it, but you'll still feel safer with the included VPN to help make you anonymous online. Browse safely and securely today by going to totalav.com slash deadmeatjames and get Total AV for just $29.99 a year. That's 70% off its retail price. That's TotalAV.com slash DeadMeatJames for internet security at less than 30 bucks a year. How many college kids will become calories for these cannibals? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins in the Mountain State, which, by the way, pretty boring nickname, West Virginia. Rich and Haley, a handsome, fit couple, are climbing one of these West Virginian mountains to get a good gander at all that unspoiled nature. As Haley struggles to finish the climb, Rich is killed off screen. His body does a little peekaboo and drips some blood onto Haley before it's yeeted off the cliff by the unseen killer. Haley eventually falls and lands right next to Rich's body. She almost makes it back to their SUV, but she's tripped by razor wire and killed off screen after her body is dragged away. The opening credits show us that lately, a whole bunch of crimes have been committed by mountain men who are deformed from inbreeding. A common trope when it comes to Appalachia that I'm sure those fine folks are just fucking thrilled about. It's on an Appalachian highway that hunky med student Chris Flynn, played by Desmond Harrington, gets caught in standstill traffic. Since he has an important appointment to get to, he turns around hoping to find another way. Hey, careful dude, you're driving off the grid now. Though, thankfully, that Nokia can double as a blunt instrument if need be. He gets to a gas station tended by a one-tooth Pepto-Bismol chugging dirty man and sees on a map there might be a way around the traffic jam. Bear Mountain Road, which the attendant says is dirt. Bet they ain't go around the paving it yet. That's no deterrence for Chris, who rides his Mustang to a fork in the road and turns left for Bear Mountain. Racing through the woods, Chris jams out to Queens of the Stone Age's debut album, which, like, is a good album and all, but this is 2003. Rated R and Songs for the Deaf are out. What are you doing, dude? A dead deer on the side of the road distracts Chris from these feel-good hits of the summer, and he crashes his car into the back of a Range Rover. The owners come out of the woodwork, to see what happened to their SUV, which was sitting in the middle of the road because their tires blew out after they drove over some razor wire. And as Jesse here just discovered, that wire wasn't there by accident. I just found this tied to a tree back there. Somebody did this. Jesse decides to take a group, including Chris, to go look for help, leaving horny couple Evan and Francine behind at the range no longer rover. Evan's played by Kevin Zegers, smack dab between his quadrilogy of Air Bud films and his role in the Dawn of the Dead remake while Francine is played by Lindy Booth, who was also in the Dawn of the Dead remake, as well as the Bon Jovi co-starring Cry Wolf, which Chelsea and I covered on the podcast a couple of years ago. Bon Jovi gets... Shot to the heart, and you're too late. 
I'm not making it up, that is actually what happens. The two of them get high and stare at the world through yellow tinted safety goggles until they decide to do something a bit more fun. Now get them trousers off, boy, don't be a sissy. Damn, is she Riley gonna grant him a blowjob in the middle of the woods? Talk about roadside service. Later on, they look through Chris's car, and as Francine disrespects Josh Homme, Evan wanders into the woods to get killed. It happens off screen, but he's probably dead by time Francine finds his ear on the ground. The dramatic push-ins are a good sign of death, you know? Francine's not far behind on the kill count, since she backs into a towering figure who slips some razor wire around her head and garrots her through the mouth with it. Chris properly introduces himself to Scott, an affable tall glass of baritone played by Jeremy Sisto, who has lifelong goodwill with me thanks to Suburgatory. Scott's engaged to Sporty Spice Carly, played by Emmanuel Shrieky, and he has very strong opinions about James Brown-esque singers for their wedding band. You know, a faux James Brown is, is, is really quite intolerable. Chris also gets acquainted with the no-nonsense Jesse, who is of course played by Eliza Dushku, still riding all that star power brought on by Bring It On. They travel past dead ends and through the wilderness until they find an old cabin, a discovery they celebrate with some Jay-Z. Can I get a... But ain't no one here to bounce with them. This place is as dead as all the rusting vehicles out on the lawn. Chris decides to chance an unlawful entrance in hopes of finding a phone to use. Inside, they find way too many car keys for one household to need. And way too many sunglasses. And way too many jaws. One family don't need all them jaws, I don't care how big it is. Nah, it's pretty clear pretty soon that the people who live here are hungry, hungry cannibals. And are also the ones who wrapped all that razor wire around their tires. And in case you wanted more bad news, looks like the cannibals are here, arriving in a tow truck and adding the Range Rover to their treasure field of vehicles. With the back door blocked off, the kids are forced to hide from the mountain men as they come inside, and try not to freak out too much when they see Francine's dead body. Uh-oh, Chris, might want to dodge her blood that's coming right for you. Chris and Jesse stay silent as the killers get to work on Francine's body, taking a huge saw and cutting it to pieces. Also watching this dismemberment through a kind of crazy keyhole shot is Carly and Scott. Stay quiet now, y'all. They do. Long enough for the cannibals to take a snooze, even though they've only quartered one quarter of that Francine corpse. That kind of work ethic will get you nowhere, you sleepy bastards. It allows all the kids to come out from hiding, but as they're leaving this cabin of trauma, the door spring nearly ruins their sneaking. Chris sacrifices his hand flesh to keep it from making noise, but he's ultimately unable to keep the mountain men from waking. They all run, uh, up the mountain, I guess, as the cannibals take off in their tow truck. Really like the zoom shot here as they hoot and holler their hunt on. The survivors run through the woods until they find themselves at another field of broken vehicles, showing the vast extent of this cannibal family's crime spree. Speaking of the mass murderers, here they are now. Sawtooth, One-Eye, and the littlest feller, Three-Finger. Wrong Turn was written by Alan B. McElroy, who also wrote Halloween 4, which is why I got to meet him in 2018 when Halloween Horror Nights had a solid Halloween 4 maze. His cannibal mountain men characters really grabbed Stan Winston's attention, who produced this film with a special eye towards the killers. I let everyone know it's going to be very important to me that we create the most memorable and horrific and real inbred mountain men that anyone has ever seen. Stan Winston was, of course, a makeup effects legend, responsible for the Terminator, the Predator, Edward Scissorhands, and the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. The Mountain Men, though, were mostly designed by Winston's protege, Shane Mahan, who based the character's deformities on medical references to ensure accuracy. And the effects artists weren't the only ones taking the characters seriously. Actor Ted Clark gave one eye a childlike portrayal, while the late Gary Robbins, a Canadian pro wrestler, played Sawtooth with lumbering menace. Julian Richings gave all his manic energy to Three Finger, which is hilarious when you see how pleasant the British Canadian is behind scenes. Hello. Nice to meet you. Richings also had a small part as a vagrant in Saw 4. The fuck are you looking at? 
huh? and was seen on the kill count for The Witch, where he banished Thomason's family from town. The trio of torture cannibals leave their truck running as they hunt, so Scott devises a way for the kids to commandeer it. One person will lead the killers in the wrong direction, while the others run to the truck. Huh, that sounds like a classic military maneuver. It's a classic military maneuver. Thought so. Chris volunteers as tribute, but the plan quickly fails when he takes a bullet to the leg. Scott is inspired to save the classic military maneuver, giving the mountain men a new chase that really excites Three Finger. <laughs> As the killers pursue Scott, the ladies help Chris up and take him over to the truck, where Evan's body spills out, confirming that he is in fact dead. They take the vehicle and drive down the road until they get close to Scott, who they see running through the woods. They don't see Sawtooth hunting Scott, loading up arrows like an Urukai. Scott's near salvation is stopped when he gets full-on Boromir, filled with arrows all up in his back that drop him to the ground dead. Sorry, Carly, but uh, y'all should should probably get the fuck out of there now. It's too late for Scott, whose body is dragged away by Sawtooth and One-Eye as Three Finger gallops along. Carly's in hysterics as the remaining trio find their new motorized transportation stopped by a fallen tree and some road mud. That forces them to continue on foot, which may prove to be dangerous given all these bear traps and such. Damn, cannibal hunters, you all sorts of dangerous, huh? The kids come across a watchtower, which might just have a phone array Radio inside. They make the long ascent, partially in front of a woefully 2003 green screen, and climb up through the hatch into the tower. Oh shit, this reminds me of that Firewatch game. Any y'all play that? Good game. They find a first aid kit and some industrial sized glow sticks, but the real prize discovery is an old radio. As they try to figure out how to work it, they see the cannibals approaching down below with torches. The killers are just about to keep on walking by when the radio comes to life and alerts them to the kid's location. As Three Finger climbs up the ladder, the kids barricade the hatch and do a very piss poor job of relaying their location. I don't know my position, just help us! The final kibosh is put on the radio plan when it's yanked from their hands, I guess from the wires going down below. Unable to get in, the killers decide to smoke the survivors out and set the watchtower on fire. The kids realize that their best course of action is to jump 20 feet into the tree branches below, and like many a flying squirrel, that's exactly what they do. After Chris comes Carly, and then finally Jessie, who does an elbow drop looking fall and lands square on her side. Fucking ouch. As Three Finger once again begins an ascent to get him, the kids start creeping through the canopy. Carly gets slowed down by flying arrows though, and is killed when Three Finger swings an axe into her mouth. We get a very awesome and creatively shot kill as we see that she's been half decapitated, with her body tumbling down the tree branches like a Jurassic Park explorer. Love this damn kill. The filmmakers put a lot of care into making sure this was a memorable death. It started with rehearsals of the initial axe swing, which they wanted to be practical, and continued with a lot of storyboarding for the shot of her body falling down, which of course had to be CG. Even for that shot though, they used a practical tree that Emmanuel Shrieky stuck her head through before they animated the rest of the shot, including the tree, the branches, and the body. Great stuff. Chris and Jesse sneak away and rig up a trap with a tree branch. As Chris harnesses its elastic energy, Jesse employs a classic military maneuver by getting Three Finger to come after her. It works, and as he approaches her, making nasty noises, Chris lets loose with the tree branch and knocks the little bastard out of the tree. But don't worry, Sawtooth and One-Eye, he's not dead. Did you see a kill graphic appear? Didn't think so. Chris and Jesse make it to a waterfall that they hide behind as the cannibal hunters pass. Together, they rebandage Chris's wound, talk about Jesse's dead friends, and quote Goodwill Hunting. It's not your fault. They camp there overnight, and come morning, slide their way down some rocks to continue on trying to escape this endless forest of death. They finally come across a road, only to also come across an axe near their head. Cause the cannibals are here! They knock Chris down the mountain and steal Jesse away, but instead of going after her himself, Chris decides that the best thing he can do is recruit a cop, whom he stops in the middle of the road. The dude's actually out looking for them, thanks to their fire tower SOS, and Chris tells him that some people are dead. Dead? What people? 
people like you! Thanks to old Sawtooth there. Chris escapes into the woods before Sawtooth gets down to the car and stuffs the cop's body in the trunk. He gets in to take the car home, and Chris hitches a ride in a totally baller way, rolling beneath it and hanging on like Sideshow Bob. Sawtooth drives the cop car back to his cabin, where Jesse is in restraints and being petted by one eye when he's not too busy brandishing a blade at her throat. Chris finally gets to give his arms a break as the cannibals drag the cop's body inside the house. They hack off its head as Jesse wriggles and squirms about, but before one eye can keep her still, a fire erupts at their front door. Man, you guys' house is on fire. Couldn't get much worse than this. Never mind, now you've got an SUV in your living room. Chris throws a Molotov cocktail that sets Sawtooth on fire, then grabs a wrench and uses it to stab the big man in the chest. This puts him down, but not for long, since he interrupts Chris's untying of Jesse to resume the fight. She's free enough to reach a bow and arrow, and she puts Sawtooth down again by lodging an arrow in the back of his head. Three Finger shows up next and fights them until an axe is slammed into his chest. But none of these fuckers have actually been killed yet. Not even one eye who got run over by that car. Chris and Jesse back out of the cabin slowly, and with the gun's last shot, Chris aims for a gas tank and fires. Now, listen, I have to address this here, because this came up when Chelsea and I reviewed this movie on the podcast two years ago. That fucking explosion sounds like James Brown at the beginning of I Feel Good. Don't believe me? Here's the explosion. And here's I Feel Good. Wow! I feel good! And need I remind you, Mr. Brown was previously mentioned in this movie by Scott. You know, a faux James Brown is, is, is really quite intolerable. So, wrong turn samples James Brown. That's my head cannon. Wow! I'll also say it's canon that Sawtooth and One-Eye are killed by this explosion slash fire. They're never seen past this point chronologically, while Three Finger lives on to giggle it up through all the sequels. The movie ends with Chris and Jesse driving the tow truck back to the gas station, where Chris takes the map so they can finally get out of there. That'll do, Chris. That'll do. How many people got killed in Them Their Mountains? Let's find out and get to Them Their Numbers. Oh, wait a minute. Nope, not making that mistake. Nine people died in Wrong Turn, and with six of them male and three of them female, that gave us a two to one ratio of dude deaths. With a runtime of 84 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every nine and a third minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Carly, definitely. Three Finger left her looking like a South Park Canadian, the crazy uncle fucker. Huh, that insult probably works with these dudes too. Dull Machete for lamest kill will go to Haley from the cold open, since she was dragged off screen and killed unseen. And that's it. Wrong Turn came out in 2003 and spawned a whole damn franchise of bloody cannibalism. The next movie's probably my favorite of the series, so tune in for that next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Shannon Evanson, Jesus Guardado, Justin Robinson, Ivy King, and Mr. Nice Guy 420. Really wanted to run off to the numbers giggling like three finger, but I can't do that giggle, man. <laughs> no, it's, it's just not good. Like I mentioned, I have a special surprise coming up on The Kill Count soon. Might take me a few more weeks to get it ready, but you'll know it when you see it. Be good people.